and I think we're live. I'd like to say uh, welcome everyone to our live stream today. Very glad y'all could join us. We are coming to you courtesy of runzero.com, which offers quick and easy asset discovery and visibility into what's connected to your networks. Real quick here before we kick things off uh, with the discussion, I'd like to point out that if you have any questions for our guest today, we have two ways that you can share those questions. Uh, first, you can log into YouTube and drop your question in the YouTube chat window. Second, you can tweet at Run Zero Inc. That's at Run Zero Inc. One word uh, with your question and, and use the hashtag scanning. We'll do our best to work your questions into the discussion uh, or at the end as time permits. And with that, let's get things going. Today we'll be chatting on the evolution of network scanning with two folks who have had very measurable impacts in the network scanning and security spaces. I'm actually going to be lazy and let our guests provide their own introductions here. Gordon, would you introduce yourself and share how you got started in network discovery and scanning? Absolutely. Thank you, Pierce. Um, I guess I've been doing network scanning for a few decades now, you know, it's always been a passion of mine, um, you know, from, you know, creating the MAP security scanner, you know, back in 1997. So I'm happy that we're, you know, now about to celebrate our 25th anniversary in uh, next week. And so that's really exciting. And then, you know, I've been kind of growing it with some other tools and websites than, since then, such as uh, seclist.org, our security mailing list archive site, um, sectools.org, our security tools site, um, NPCAP, which is our Windows packet capturing library and uh, for sending raw packets as well. And so I've basically, you know, been focused in recent decades on um, kind of tools for network discovery and active scanning. That's awesome. Uh, and flip it around to HD. HD, would you uh, introduce yourself and share how you got started in the network discovery and scanning places? Sure, howdy. Um, HD Moore, co-founder of Run Zero, uh, CTO here as well. Uh, I've been doing security stuff forever. Uh, I think probably most folks know me from working at Metasploit for like 15 years and lots of random researchy stuff back in the old days. Um, you know, I really got into security starting off with like, you know, phone lines and BBSs and things like that before like the internet was a big thing. And it was a lot of fun kind of playing around with that stuff. But, um, you know, really early on, I discovered IRC and lots of hackers on IRC. And then this awesome tool called Nmap, which let me find all kinds of cool stuff on the internet. And so, you know, the, the thing I was doing before then, which was like word dialing random numbers uh, to figure out what was out there, it was a lot of fun to do the exact same thing, but now with Nmap across the whole world and figuring out what's out, you know, what's hanging out in the network in Myanmar or, uh, you know, Indonesia or you know, wherever. So it was a great way to kind of see the world electronically back in the day. From the comfort of your own home. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, HD. Um, neat. Uh, Gordon, you just, there's something you touched on I want to circle back to. So next month, or actually next week, as you mentioned, will mark 25 years uh, since the, the FRAC article that contained uh, and announce an announcement for Nmap to the world. Uh, may, maybe little did we know at that time that, that, that 25 years later we'd be talking about it, and it's still going strong. Uh, that's an amazing milestone for any project. Uh, I was hoping maybe you could take us back to 1997 and talk a little bit about what led you to create the initial version of Nmap. Oh, thank you. It's uh, it is kind of incredible to think it's been a quarter of a century now. It was kind of a different world for me. I had. I uh, started college at the University of Arizona and the dorm rooms had just gotten this new thing, you know, residential Ethernet. So to have like a 10 megabit connection always on all the time, you know, no more having to dial modems, you know, deal with sharing phone lines and long distance and all that. And so, you know, I kind of was in this new world and really wanted to explore the network. And so I, um, I, at the time, used a lot of other tools like, uh, like Strobe from Julian Assange, who's now, you know, a bit famous for other things. Um, and there was one called RefleScan and SynScan. And I ended up having a directory full of different scanners, which all had different command line flags and, you know, had hacked them up in a lot of different ways that finally I decided, you know, 
I just want to create my own scanner with all of my favorite network scanning techniques, you know, all of my, you know, command line options to do the flexible things, you know, that I want it to be able to do. And I ended up spending a summer at um, the Johns Hopkins has this center for talented youth. And I wasn't one of those, but I was a teaching assistant for those. And so again, they gave me a dorm room that I had uh, ethernet access in. And I kind of spent that summer basically just writing Nmap for my own purposes uh, back in 97. And when I kind of had it working well, I was like, hey, you know, who knows, maybe someone else will find this useful as well. So I sent it in to uh, Mike Schiffman route, who was then the editor of FRAC and, you know, hope for the best. And, you know, it got accepted and published and I kind of was like, well, that project's done. I guess I can move on to other things now. But, you know, I was uh, surprised by the sort of groundswell of support um, that it received, you know, all sorts of people sending me patches, uh, you know, fixing bugs, you know, some bugs that were kind of, you know, embarrassing, like I should have should have coded that better. So I'm like, okay, I'll do one more release with all these fixes and then then I can get back to just, you know, my own scanning. But um, but it just it just snowballed and continued to grow and more and more releases. And as we kind of added exciting new features, like, you know, it started out just doing host discovery, you know, to find the systems out on the network and port scanning, but then uh, adding operating system detection. So we could actually see what those systems were and then version detection. So we could actually interrogate the ports and figure out, you know, what's actually running, you know, is it really a web server on port 443 or 80, or are they, you know, running some other, other service there, you know, in order to, you know, maybe get through some firewall rule. So service detection, and then, and then later the Nmap scripting engine, you know, which allowed us to add hundreds of scripts to kind of let, you know, anyone who kind of had some sort of, you know, network scanning related task they wanted to do or discovery, you know, could write a script and we could stick it in Nmap and 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 enable a much more diverse amount of functionality without, you know, bloating, you know, the core of Nmap. Yeah, that's uh that's pretty wild how, you know, from from initial all right, I put the, I did this thing and I'm, I think I'm kind of done. Oh, there's a bug fix. I think I'm kind of done. 25 years later, it's a, it's a full-time job for you, right? I mean, am I wrong? Is that right? It is. I used yeah. to be just part-time. You know, I was in college and then, you know, I started working for a little startup that got bought by Netscape and then that was bought by AOL and then that was bought by Time Warner. Um, but then, you know, to be able to quit my job and work on Nmap full-time, you know, has been, you know, my dream job ever since then. So... I, I feel really lucky and privileged to have that opportunity. Well, I love, I love it. Uh, I'll flip it over to HD here real quick. So, so, you know, going back in time, you know, Gordon took us back to 1997. Um, thinking back to the late 90s, uh, what were some of the tools you were using around that time for network scanning and discovery? There's a lot of overlap with what Gordon mentioned, you know, um, uh, Strobe, Flash.c, um, all the random tools. But, I, you know, I really got excited about writing my own stuff. I felt like... Um, especially with network discovery tools, like you're kind of stuck working within the box of whatever the tool defines. And so just like Gordon's like, hey, but I want to do this other thing. Like UDP scanning is something that was always really difficult to do with existing tools. Like if you do a UDP scan, the normal way, like to send, you know, send uh, zero byte packets, you, you don't really get a reply unless you get an ICP response. It doesn't really fingerprint the protocol. So I spent a lot of time working on like UDP scanners myself, like doing like NFS pinging tools or uh, like SNP enumeration tools and NetBIOS pings and things like that. I felt like there's a whole like, undiscovered world of fun UDP services out there that folks just were not scanning early on. And I, I really enjoyed working on that stuff and building little scanning tools for it, wrote some like SMB scanners and things like that. And then over the years, I started working on various like internet scanning projects. And I just really liked the, the idea of like taking disparate information from assets and, and putting it together and building something bigger out of it. Like, okay, well, this packet says it's this type of OS with this secondary interface. This one says it's part of this domain and then trying to glue all that together into something comprehensive. That's always kind of been my approach for the pen test work and the red team work I was doing. And then I also got to leverage a lot of that um, perspective when working on tools like the Metasploit Scanner and the Metasploit Pro product or the various commercial products I worked on over the years at RAP7 and Breaking Point. Um, it was just kind of more of the same. I felt like um, 
just so with exploit development, one of the coolest things about like building an exploit is leaking a pointer, finding fun ways to determine the exact target and offsets before you actually trigger the, the payload. Um, I feel like with network discovery, it's the same thing. It's the same kind of challenge of how do I take all these little tiny information leaks and build up something really useful with it. And so that kind of like figuring out what's out in the unknown and, you know, throwing that penny down the well and listening for the ping has always been kind of my cup of tea in what I enjoy doing. Oh, right on. That's a great answer. Um, so, you know, thinking about, you know, Gordon, you, you, you discussed how uh, user, user needs and, and user um, kind of interactions and, and, and people kind of helped, you know, give, give uh, NMAP some legs, uh, even, even if maybe that, 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 that hadn't been, um, you know, the, the original thought, uh, original intent uh, back in the day. Uh, you know, here we are 25 years later and, you know, like everybody I know uh, in security and network management, you know, spaces, they keep in mapping their toolbox, they pull it out regularly, um, you know, and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to cue a little roll, a little video clip here, cue the roll clip of like in map has even appeared in a few movies, such as the matrix reloaded, which is a great movie uh, and everybody should watch it. We'll see if the clip clip plays. If not, Y'all should go watch Matrix Reloaded just for the scene where Trinity uses NMAP. It's 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 totally worth it. Um, and so, uh, but you know, Gordon, I'm curious. You thinking about perfect timing? Let's see right there, SSH is open. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so thinking about you know now the, the, the hitting this 25 year mark, quarter of a century, as you said. Um, what are, what do you feel are reasons or perhaps secrets for NMAP's staying power over these last 25 years? Hmm. Good question. And, uh, thanks for the call out on the matrix. I feel like I'm a little bit just sort of coasting on some residual coolness, you know, that I got back in 2003 when Trinity used NMAP to hack the matrix. You know, I was watching it on a midnight showing right when it came out and, you know, couldn't believe you know, the hacking scene was coming and I'm like, oh no, these are always so stupid. And then she whips out NMAP, you know, uses it to hack the utility station, you know, after riding it on a motorcycle, you know, it was pretty badass. And it's still the background of our Facebook page. And I've got my Trinity poster, uh, you know, back here. So, um, so yes. And then since then, you know, it's been in many dozens of movies from, you know, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Die Hard 4, Born Ultimatum. Um, and so it's kind of one of those weird things where something I would have never imagined, you know, starting up like, you know, why would NMAP, you know, turn out to be what Hollywood decides to use in their movies. Um, but it's like, I don't know, after it, you know, it's another case of that snowballing, like after it, you know, was in the Matrix, then you know, digital asset managers and such started, you know, thinking, hey, this looks pretty cool. So, you know, I kind of made NMAP's output to be functional and useful. But, you know, if it also looks like cool gibberish to people who want to portray that in a movie, well, that's, that's cool, too. Um, I think your question, your actual question, though, before I went down memory lane was about how users Okay, sorry. What was your question again? Sorry, this, the, any secrets to the staying power of NMAP? Like, why? Why twenty five years later, it's still something that people reach for. I mean, we we use it regularly at work and um, you know personal projects and stuff. Just like yeah, any any, any other than other than product placement that you didn't have to pay for <laughs> in so many movies. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you had any any secrets or anything off the top of your head, like you know any of the stuff you've added like the os detection features or the scripting engine that have kind of kind of helped keep the momentum going um with the project so many projects we see you know don't only last for a little time or that you know creator walks off or whatever you know just curious if you had any 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 insights into how nmaps managed to stay so relevant over 25 years yeah that's a that's a good question i think you know even though i kind of like to think oh it was like you know brilliant design and forward thinking and all that um i think we benefited a lot, you know, from the timing, like, you know, when I released it, you know, it was still a somewhat, you know, nascent internet and scanning, you know, was really hard. You know, if you had to like, you know, download some scanner source code and compile it and fix little C errors and, you know, NMAP really made it a lot easier, I think, to, you know, scan in a fast, consistent, 
way and really understand your um, your network better, you know, before you had the option of, you know, getting run zero and having it just kind of, you know, click go and having it find, you know, all your systems on your network, which works really well, by the way. I, uh, I ran it and found, you know, systems. I was like, wait a minute, that has an IP address. You know, my partner's, uh, you know, Roomba robotic vacuum, you know, what is that uh, doing here? Um, so, you know, or systems that only have like an IP V6 address, you know, like, you know, good job at, at finding that. Um, and so I think because Nmap was kind of there at that early stage and everyone started using it, you know, in, in their toolbox, I think, you know, hackers and security practitioners, especially, you know, we want to trust our tools. I guess a lot of, you know, professionals are like that, you know, when you get a tool and it works well for you and you learn how to use it, you know, there's kind of a lot of staying power in wanting to uh, keep using that tool. And sometimes it backfires. There are, I think, a lot of Nmap users who kind of learned about it, you know, decades ago and kind of, you know, read the man page then, but then they haven't kept up with all of the improvements you know, that have been made since then, you know, which could make their scanning a lot, you know, better and more effective. They'll say, yeah, I love MMAP, but I really want, you know, this feature here. And I'll be like, we added that in 2008. You know, <laughs> I, I get that, you know, the, the MMAP book I wrote is 400 pages of port scanning, which not everyone, oh, apparently, apparently Pierce has got it. So it may not be for everyone, but I'm glad that uh, the diehards you know, can read that, but, you know, at least, you know, if people focus on like the change log and the man page, you know, there's a ton of stuff we've added, but a lot of the time people tend to gravitate to kind of the way they, they used it before. And so basically as the security and networking space has absolutely exploded over the last 25 years, I think, and map sort of came along for the ride to some degree as part of people's toolbox. I mean, of course, it was critical that we kept actively developing it the whole time and adding things, you know, when when IPv6, you know, became way more important, you know, when SSL started taking over all the protocols, you know, and we're still, you know, looking at what's coming, you know, just a couple of days ago, you know, there's a HTTP like protocol that, you know, Google uses, you know, in Chrome, um, that, that we're looking at adding res V, I think something like that. Um, and so just, just a couple of days ago, I was researching that a little bit. Um, so it's kind of a combination of kind of building a foundation, you know, that people like and use and then sticking with it and, and focusing on where networks are going and where we can add the most most value to people and keeping up with all the changes. Just to add on to that, um, like, I don't think a lot of folks realize how far uh, MMAP and a lot of Gordon's work has gone. Like, nearly every security product on the planet uses something from Gordon somewhere. It's either using NPCAP, it's using the NMAP fingerprint library, or it's using MMAP directly. And it goes well beyond like vulnerability scanners. You're seeing AV tools these days embedding MMAP to discover pure devices. You're seeing um, like all your standard network monitoring tools these days, like Wireshark um, switched over to using NPCAP, which is amazing. We talk about NPCAP a little bit later, but holy cow, like the fact that like so much of the world now runs on like hacker tools is amazing. Like the fact that like insurance companies are now actively scanning your external IP space with Nmap in 2022, it just blows my mind how far we've come from the early days. Yeah, well said, uh, you know, and it may not be as much eye candy as hacking the Gibson or this uh, Jurassic Parks. This is Unix. I know this, uh, but it, it certainly it has its staying power. You know, it keeps, you know, keeps adding new features that are relevant to the users and what users need to you know, help their jobs, you know, make their jobs easier. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that all that forward looking uh, it definitely it sounds like it's paid off, um, you know, thinking around, you know, speaking of that. Um, that kind of forward thinking, um, you know, uh, pulling that thread a little bit, Gordon, is that something, um, you know, I, I'm curious if there, are, you know, you mentioned it as an example, like a, a protocol, like, hey, there's, 
there's the types of that work of, of kind of research and you know the, the you do to kind of you know keep keep things current um it, it, there's uh, i'm curious if there's um kind of up, what kind of updates or changes that you and your teams might be working on to ensure that nmap stays compatible with emerging technologies in general yeah that's a good question and Quick was the protocol I referenced before. So thanks, Pizza Boy 133233. Um, and as far as new um, new things that we kind of work on to stay compatible, I think the explosion of you know internet devices, you know, from Internet of Things, you know, it was a lot easier to do, you know, say OS fingerprinting or service fingerprinting back when, you know, you had your Spark systems and your Linux systems and some BSD systems and, you know, when it was mostly PCs. Now, you know, you know, and then the database would be, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of systems, you know, now it's a lot more challenging to keep up with, you know, the Roombas and, you know, internet connected thermostats and, and all that. And so, having a user base with millions of users, you know, who are passionate enough, passionate enough to submit things when they're found, you know, helps us a whole lot. Also, it helps a lot in, in driving some of the ideas, like, um, like when I was looking at the quick protocol a couple of days ago, um, it was a real brief look, um, cause I kind of was in the middle of some other work, but it was from a, you know, GitHub, feature requests someone added. And I was like, hey, you know, let's look into that. And I think the things that are really starting to gain traction, you kind of see a lot, a lot of a more upswell of interest, you know, kind of before they hit mainstream. So I think keeping your ear to the ground and, you know, looking at, at what, you know, other hackers and users, you know, are passionate about um, you know, has helped guide me because, you know, I, you know, use MMAP, you know, for my own things, but that's just a tiny fraction of the huge world of things, you know, that people actually use MMAP for. Yeah, right on. Uh, and, you know, it seems like these days, you know, compared to, you know, 20, you know, 25 years ago, maybe, uh, they, they were so much more interconnected and have opportunities to hear from users in, in, in many different ways. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of times we have to decide which which ways we're, we're willing to take that information and other ways which we're like, no, we're not going to have too many information overload. But, um, you know, HD curious around, <clears throat> you know, thinking around, you know, um, use cases and users, um, you know, and, and, and topics of user needs. Uh, can you share some of the experiences you've had over the years, which kind of led you to see a need for what you and your teams are currently building at Run Zero? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing we noticed again and again, especially as security gets more mature at larger organizations, is if they know about an asset, they probably already have some sort of mitigation for it. So if they know where that network is, they know what the device is, they may already have vulnerability management, they may have an EDR in place, they may have vulnerable scanning of some sort, uh, they may have network monitoring. So you know, as we're seeing kind of the whole industry kind of level up, um, the things you know about are getting better. And the challenge really is all the other stuff. How do you make sure your PCI uh, CDE is separate, is segmented correctly? How do you make sure that your HVAC network is accessible from your main corporate network? It's, it's all that kind of oddball, you know, in the periphery stuff that ends up getting people breached. And that's where uh, I felt like uh, my experience provide the most value and kind of what we've been focusing on at Run Zero is how do we find like every possible routable network from within your organization? So you can start with literally nothing and say, go find everything. And we'll scan all RFC 1918. We'll do all um, IPv6 link local. And we do it all by default. I mean, that's the kind of the big differences. If you look at a lot of security tooling, they pretend IPv6 doesn't exist unless you explicitly add an IPv6 target. And that means no one really does, no one really scans IPv6 unless they explicitly go look for it. We really took the other approach of saying, every device in the world has a v6 address. It has at least one link local. Therefore, we should be scanning it by default. And so we enable that stuff by default. And so folks are just blown away, like, hey, um, how come I've got a telnet port on this device's link local interface, but not on its IPv4 interface? So it's that kind of stuff that I think we're helping folks uncover. And one of the fun things about you know starting off with Run Zero is very much like, let's go gather a bunch of information, let's correlate it, let's do, how can we determine that the same device has multiple IPs in the network at the same time? But 
the more of this data we get over time, the bigger our user base is getting. We have like over 15,000 free users in the platform, in addition to our paying customers. We're able to use that data and build even better stuff out of it. We're able to say like, holy cow, this device has this weird secondary interface or responds a strange way and just getting better and better about doing the correlation, doing the analysis, doing the fingerprinting. So um, for us, it's been, you know, listening to customers saying, hey, like I'm running this weird device. We don't know what it is. But like, well, that's a good question. Let's go figure out what that thing is. Um, probably one of my uh, funnest or not necessarily fun, but interesting experience with, at Run Zero was we had a customer who had a mandate saying we cannot have Huawei equipment on the network. Just kind of a standard thing if you're a federal contractor or anybody who works for federal contractors, you can't have certain manufacturers in the network. And they're swearing up and down. They did not have a Huawei device in the network, but we kept reporting one anyways. And we were reporting it in the SNP art cache of a printer. So we couldn't scan the device directly, but we could tell you it was there because it was hanging off of a printer's art cache. So the printer could see it, even though our scanner couldn't see it directly. And it was just driving them crazy. They literally tore the entire network apart, they rebuilt it from scratch, and the device was still there. And they're like, your scanner is busted. You guys are lying. Like, we're not lying. I swear it's there. Like, unless this printer is just making up its art cache, it is, it is there. Ends up, it was the uh, Tech's phone in his pocket the entire time. <laughs> so he had a Huawei Peer Series phone, and that apparently was just did not occur to him that that would be on the network. So it was really fun kind of chasing that stuff down and trying to figure out you know, when you have a, a list of vendors that you need to find really quickly, when you have a type of device or service, just how do you quickly find all that stuff? And, you know, listening to our users and getting feedback from the community, um, having an open beta early on, that was all really critical to getting us to where we are today, which is helping people solve like real problems. Right on. Uh, no, great, 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 great answer. The, the Huawei one's a, a, a funny one because that's literally the call is coming from inside the house. It being a phone. I don't know. I'm just a stretch there. Uh, we had we had a question come in and it's it's kind of it's kind of uh, for both of you all. Uh, we'll start with Gordon. Um, so there was a, a question about like what's next for Nmap development? Uh, let's see. I mean, what we're we have focused a huge amount of time over the last couple of years on NPCAP because, you know, when PCAP was, you know, abandoned in 2013 and it was sort of an existential issue for us, you know, if we don't, if we're not able to send and receive raw packets on Windows, you know, we're not going to be able to do much, you know, yeah, and MAP has sort of a backup approach using the socket, Sockets API, but that is not, um, you know, it doesn't allow MMAP to do some of the coolest things, you know, that involve crafting, you know, all the specifics of raw packets, you know, like the OS detection, you know, as a major example, or, or the default SIN scan or ARP scanning. And so we were like, well, you know, we'll just kind of take over maintenance. We'll just kind of create our own NPCAP based on that. And then, you know, we'll have our own thing and then we can move back to NMAP. Well, it, it turns out that Windows kernel development is not an easy task. You know, even even just doing that, what seems like the simple things of like, you know, getting Microsoft to sign your driver so it can be loaded in the kernel without, you know, a bunch of, you know, warnings. Um, you know, basically NPCAP has turned out to be far more difficult than we, we expected, um, but also far more valuable because, you know, while we made it, for Nmap, so it would have a stable, secure, reliable um, a system for packet raw packet stuff on Windows. Um, it turned out that tons of other, you know, projects needed it as well. You know, Run Zero uses it. Uh, Wireshark, um, you know, made it their default. You know, even though, you know, they're actually the ones who are were in charge of WinPCAP and developed it in the first place. I guess they were kind of happy. They know how much work it was, is, and so they were happy to offload it to us, I think. And so that has been a huge, huge thing. Um, but we just released um, NPCAP 1.71 uh, last Friday. And now, um, you know, I feel like it's finally to a state, you know, where it's, it's stable. The concurrency issues of when PCAP have been fixed, you know, We've done so much work to make it work with, you know, weird VPNs, weird, uh, you know, uh, interfaces like um, like the new Windows 11 on ARM. You know, often they have incorporated, you know, LTE, you know, interfaces, so it kind of acts more like a phone, which is a bit different than than an, an Ethernet style interface, where even with like Wi-Fi, you know, it basically feels like like Ethernet from the perspective of, um, of applications, you know, writing raw packets. Um, 
And so finally, I feel like it's to a state where we're really proud of it and it's really stable. And now hopefully, you know, we can, we can turn our attention to um, some of the newer things with Nmap. We collected a lot of technical debt basically during the time when, you know, all our focus, so much of our focus was on why is, you know, this weird interface, you know, causing problems when people open it on Wireshark. Um, so, you know, we've got such a huge backlog of OS detection signatures and version detection signatures, you know, ZenMap has to be, you know, updated to, you know, the latest, you know, Python 3. Um, you know, we have to improve, you know, the Mac OS version, you know, to use some of their new features. And I guess none of these sound all that exciting. I suppose, you know, people would probably rather hear about like some enormous new, you know, new feature that, you know, we were about to stun the world when we release on September 1st. Um, and so I hate to disappoint them. But on the other hand, you know, if MMAP doesn't work well on your system, then, you know, whatever systems, or if it crashes your system, you know, because of a crappy, you know, driver or, you know, then then all the features in the world, you know, don't don't matter as much. So the initial thing we're excited about, you know, OpenSSL has had, you know, like half a dozen, you know, security vulnerabilities and none of them, you know, the, the Windows OpenSSL DLLs we ship, you know, none of them affect NMAP because of the way those vulnerabilities, you know, they, they're in like features we don't use, but it's still kind of scary if you run a, you know, auditing application and it's like, oh, we detected insecure DLLs. So, so yeah, I think, you know, all of that sounds boring, but I think it builds the foundation of, you know, allowing us, we're also planning to, planning to grow, um, you know, actually hire some more developers because, you know, I work with a guy, Dan Miller, and, you know, we do all our can all we can, but like I said, now that we're in a world where, you know, so many hundreds of products are released every month, um, it's very, it's a lot harder for a tiny team uh, to deal with. And in terms of the specific question that someone mentioned about a mass scan and asynchronous scanners like that, I think Nmap, um, has some uh, features like the hyphen hyphen min rate feature, which allows you to tell, like by default, you know, people say, oh, Nmap is so much slower. That's because Nmap by default is kind of playing nice with other applications on the network. And it's, you know, actually implementing TCP congestion control, you know, as well as, you know, congestion control on the other, you know, protocols as well. Um, so that if it detects, you know, any drops, you know, it slows down exponentially like it's, it's supposed to, and then, you know, slowly starts to speed up. So by default, you know, sometimes people are frustrated that, you know, how come when I tell mass scan and I just say send 100,000 packets per second, how come it's so much faster? Well, that's because mass scan, mass scan is doing what you told it to. And then, you know, any drops that it causes other applications sharing the network and other systems, you know, then they detect those drops and then they slow down and it gets to a point where do you want to, you know, you want your scan to go fast, but you also don't want to disrupt everyone else's use of the network. But for cases where you, you know what you're doing um, and you really do want to tell Nmap, hey, just like go at it as fast as you can. Um, some of the features like the hyphen hyphen min rate you can use to say, hey, always send at least a thousand packets per second or 10,000 packets per second. You can change max retries because, you know, the mass scan style, it doesn't even remember what packets it sent. It just, you know, spews send packets all over and then, you know, looks for ACK in the response. But if a you know, 90% of your packets were dropped because you, you know, guessed at a packet rate that turns out faster than your network is supporting at the time, you know, you don't know. And so by default, MMAP, you know, actually tracks what packets it sent 
and and so it knows if if they were dropped and then it retransmits them if it got no response but you know again if if you want more of a mass scan style just like go at it like if you're just doing a survey and it doesn't have to be 100 percent comprehensive but you kind of just want a real fast look you know set hyphen hyphen max retry zero to tell nmap you know never retry so i think you can actually get those mass scan style performance if you basically tell nmap don't do congestion control send this many packets per second um and you know don't bother you know retrying packets you know if you don't get a response and i think we should document it better we have the performance section of the nmap book um and which is online you know for free and so i think if people read that i think they'll find that they can get just as good of performance. And I've always wanted to, you know, create a document that's kind of more specific to, hey, you want to basically recreate the the mass scan style or the Z map approach of just spew packets out as fast as you can and hope for the best and see what comes back. And so, but in lieu of that kind of more specific documentation, um, I think the MAP performance uh, chapter of the book um, kind of explains the options you can use to, you know, you can set your timeouts faster. You know, there's a lot you can do um, to meet or exceed those those speeds. Very cool. Uh, the, the the flip part to that was, uh, you know, okay, HD, what, where do you think NMAP should be spending it, it, its time? <laughs> or, or, or what do you think they should be working on? I'm, I'm a very happy customer of MPCAP. <laughs> like, I feel like, it, I mean, the boring stuff is the most important stuff. Like without MPCAP, most of the network monitoring tools and scanning tools that you guys know and actually use today wouldn't work right now. Um, so many of the um, the tools used for network monitoring would have just stopped working uh, like three years ago if it wasn't for Gordon and his team working on MPCAP. So I do not want to discount how important MPCAP is to the entire security industry right now. So many products are based on it. And without that, we wouldn't have had Windows 10 support. Uh, after a certain build number, it just nothing was really working right. I mean, I've been on a lot of pen tests where we actually broke in through an old WinPCAP driver. Like we were able to sniff traffic as a non-admin user on like an exchange box and stole clear text cred that way. Like that's the kind of stuff that like MPCAP solves. So not to be too much of a fan of what MPCAP, but it's super important and it's awesome. Um, if you look at the things over the years that like everyone's like, well, I like MAP, but I don't like X. A lot of them tends to be around like minimum rate stuff. Like, oh, it's, it's being too nice to network. And you can definitely make anything you want out of MAP. Like I, for many years, I was running dash dash min rate, min rate tries one, uh, setting like group size to be huge and just like throwing lots of memory bandwidth out and calling it done. And you can get really close to like a ZMAP or mass scan style um, performance just using MAP alone with the right flag. So I, I wouldn't discount MAP as a mass scanning tool if you configure it correctly. A lot, a lot of my internet wide surveys were with MAP and it worked just fine. Um, there's definitely lots of cool things MAP could be doing uh, in terms of like doing more asset inventory stuff, more deeper protocol fingerprinting. Um, but I'll leave that up to the community and Gordon and his team to do. So definitely don't want to tell them what they should go work on. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing that I, I think is really um, that I found interesting working on Run Zero is that we always try to tell you as many different things about an asset as we can. So it's not just here you got one IP address, but also, hey, these other five IPs are all really the same asset. We do some correlation on that. And that does something like that as well. And the, some of the um, NSC scripts will do correlation of assets and new target discovery. Um, but other things that are really useful are like identifying all the different host names associated with an asset. So let's go pull the TLS serve, dump the CN, but then let's go use that name that we found in the CN to make a web request with that as a VOS or SNI for TLS. So there's like some more advanced like application level stuff that of course MAP could probably go way down that path. Like y'all could also be the best web app scanner in the world if you really want to do. Um, I don't know how interesting that would be for you, but <laughs> there's definitely a ton of cool stuff happening there. And then there's all these kind of like, you know, new world like uh, HP and HP like protocols. So we've got HP3 coming out, you got quick, uh, all this DTLS stuff, all the cope things. There's all this just kind of like wonky HTTP like traffic out there that no one's really gone super deep down in terms of scanning it. So there's a lot of like, um, uh, you know, dark space out there that no one's really covering with security tools in terms of scanning these other protocols or, um, protocols are, ex are extended by IP. So if you find like a backnet controller identifying all the machines behind the backnet controller on the RS4545 side. So there's all kinds of fun OT stuff that of course MAP can get on that path too. Yeah, one thing I'd like to mention real quick is when we were talking about ways to find, you know, uh, improvements and ideas. Uh, one thing uh, we're really good at with MAP is stealing other people's ideas. Let's say incorporating good ideas that other people in the security community have found 
And in particular, I'd like to mention, you know, Run Zero. You know, if you look at their blog and look at how their software works, there are actually, you know, several ideas that, you know, I saw that that looked so cool that I immediately like filed a ticket on myself in our bug tracker on GitHub to say, hey, we should we should look into getting in on that. Uh, one of them, Nmap. You know, for decades we take the IEEE, you know, releases a a, a file of MAC address prefixes assigned to different vendors. So forever, Nmap has kind of said, hey, if the MAC address starts with this prefix, you know, then it is an Intel or an HP or a Roomba or whatever. Um, but I saw that Run Zero took it a little bit further instead of just taking that file, you know, and like, you know, using it with each release to do the lookup, they look at how the file changes each time a new version is released. So they can determine the date that that um, particular Mac prefix was assigned. So if it's like Apple, you know, they're assigned new prefixes all the time because, you know, they release so many products that they run through them. And so, you know, if you can say, hey, this is an Apple device and the prefix was assigned in 2020, you know, it gives you a really good idea of how, um, you know, how modern or recent of a system it is, you know. And so, because you know, it wasn't, it wasn't released any time before that. Um, another thing that uh, Run Zero does very well uh, is they did this DCE RPC fingerprinting research to find ways to, you know, not only remotely determine the OS of, you know, Windows systems without um, authentication, you know, but also determine all sorts of other random stuff like, you know, network cards that they're using and so forth. And so that was another case where I was just like, you know, reading the, the blog post, you know, they did on it. And I'm like, oh, this is a good idea. We should, you know, steal it with full credit. Um, you know, I think that's why they they post these things is to to say, hey, you know, here's something, you know, that that's pretty cool that we're doing. And I think kind of part of this in the same way as, you know, Nmap has surely inspired, you know, a lot of different um different applications and stuff you know to to do things you know to to implement functionality that turns out to be useful and valuable to people so instead of being kind of a land of you know patent everything and restrict everything and you know not share um i'm glad that the security community you know starting from you know early days you know at the conferences and the mailing lists and the voice bridges and all that and the bbs's you know, has kind of continued even as it's become, you know, a hundreds of billions of dollar, you know, a year industry to kind of appreciate the value of, of sharing knowledge and ideas. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it, at the risk of maybe a negative connotation that I don't mean, I'll say, you know, good network scanners borrow, great network scanners steal. Uh, but, you know, it, the, the, the sharing is awesome. That's one of the, the things I like best about open source and the, the community working together. Um, you know, speaking of, uh, of scanning, uh, you know, to, as we have been uh, thinking around, you know, a lot of times when we scan networks and I think a lot of the bread and butter uh, that, that folks have used uh, Nmap for uh, is discovery of, you know, this like this laptop I'm speaking to you through or my phone or those types of, you know, printers, those types of devices, um, thinking more into, uh, you know, HD, this, I'll throw this one to you, thinking more into uh, spaces that, that maybe we don't, or a lot of scanners don't have a lot, have spend a lot of time, or a lot of us don't have a lot of experience with, or like OT and medical devices. Uh, what challenges have you run into at Run Zero when scanning like OT and, and medical type devices? Uh, like a lot of my background is either doing like pen test or vulnerable assessment work where you're running scanning tools and brand new networks you just don't know very well, or working on vulnerability management or vulnerability scanning tools uh, and making sure we don't cause problems. So a lot of my early years were like very formative episodes of causing problems with banks, like printing out obscenities on their bond paper or crashing half of a network accidentally in like the late 90s and early 2000s. So over the years, I've got an idea of like, here's kind of the things you should watch out for. And one of the things we try to do differently with run zero is we try to say like, you shouldn't have to put any exclusions into the product at all to get good results. You shouldn't crash anything at all by default by running a standard scan. And to actually do that's really hard because some devices fall over, you just look at them wrong or you connect the wrong port and don't send, don't send data will cause a device to crash, right? So 
example that both Pierce and I worked on were these like Linux, or sorry, not Linux, uh, Lantronics export modules that are embedded in everything from like parking garage gates to you name it, medical devices. And these devices, if you connect to them on a certain port and it's not configured right, the whole device will reload and restart. And there's literally, you don't even have to send data and they crash, right? So it's one of those things where if, you, if you're trying to build a scan engine that is able to identify these devices, work around them and still scan them, not just include them, but actually like scan them except for the things that crash, it's a different model than, than your standard just throw packets at it, right? So that's things where your state, your um, async and your stateless scanners have a lot, have a harder time avoiding crashing devices. You really have to have a very clear pipeline and trade-offs and fingerprinting all the way through, your, through the entire um, um, discovery process to make sure that you can safely identify and, and uh, you know, detect those devices. So we kind of took the approach of like, let's be as safe as possible all the time. Let's not send any traffic that isn't normal traffic. And that means giving up, like we don't do really cool things like the CNFE fingerprinting that like MAP does. We, we unfortunately just don't do it because we had so many folks saying, well, we don't do MAP because it acts. And like, well, we think it's fine, but okay, we sure for now, let's go and we'll do it a different way. So we kind of, um, if you look at the difference between like a lot of the MAPs fingerprinting stuff and a lot of the run zero stuff, we do a lot more application side stuff like uh, leaking HP banners, the TLS certs, fingerprinting more app stack stuff. And MAP does a way deeper job of fingerprinting like the actual uh, layer three and TCP IP stack. And they can tell you things that we just don't, we can't obviously because we're focused more on the application side and aren't gonna send like a weird window size with a SIM packet. Yeah, uh, great. Appreciate the answer uh, and the detail there. Uh, yeah, things things can be tricky and ornery uh, depending on on where they are, how they're configured, uh, what they are. Uh, even common things like printers can be very ornery. Um, you know, a question that popped up in the chat that I'm kind of curious about the answer to uh, for you, Gordon, uh, is the top 1,000 port list still based on the scan in summer of 2008, or has it changed since then? And 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 if if it has changed, how how has it changed? Oh, good question. And first, I want to do a shout out to Ron Bose, who I see in the comments, because I was just talking about DCE RPC that HD, you know, was doing at Run Zero. And Ron Bose kind of created a lot of our MS SMB um, fingerprinting work, you know, our scripts, you know, that, you know, interrogate Windows boxes. And in the same way, as I said, you know, writing Windows drivers is really hard. Well, basically, Microsoft SMB protocol is so hairy and ugly that for a long time we didn't support it very well as all because nobody wanted to touch it but uh ron stepped up to the plate and um so you know if we ever are able to um incorporate some of the new dce rpc stuff that run zero has been doing you know we'll be asking ron for for help and advice and um so yeah thank thank you for all of that and then as far as the question, which um, which I again totally forgot about, so the top thousand ports. Uh, oh yes, yes, we, 2008. Um, yeah, now we we that is an area that definitely could be improved. We have improved the port list since then. Like when like a service becomes real popular, I kind of manually tweak the numbers a little bit so that you know, for services that didn't exist back then. But fundamentally, we created it back then um, based on like our own, you know, massive scanning and a lot of internal network logs that people sent us so that we could kind of get a good idea of both. And we kind of have always kind of wanted to set up a more regular approach, you know, so that we could, you know, always stay more up to date with with the very latest. Um, it hasn't turned out as critical because, you know, when you combine, you know, the the top 1000, you know, that kind of allows things that were still, that are still pretty obscure, you know, to still, you know, be found. Um, and so much has moved to just over, you know, HTTP and, and SSL you know, so 443, you know, has taken over, you know, so much web traffic. Um, but that definitely is an area where, where while it has improved, it hasn't improved enough since then. And we would like to get more empirical data rather than me saying, oh man, this, this protocol is getting important and it's not in the NMAPS default top 1000. So I'll just, you know, kind of, put a synthetic mark that kind of makes it look like, you know, it had been, you know, in those earlier scans. Um, 
and so uh so so yeah that's that's another case where room for improvement for sure well, we do a similar effort on run zero internally we look at like what are the most common open ports internally on internal corporate networks and then we have a you know, that's kind of how we've been designing our default list for scans and it's weird to see like what doesn't and doesn't overlap with the old nmap list for the external scans because there's definitely like some stuff you only see internally some stuff you only see externally uh and the kind of middle ground we've been doing so far is we just uh we drop the um number of ports we scan to a smaller amount and i think we only do like 500 by default right now but it's enough to cover like 95% of all the things we see internally just based on our internal stats. And where we um, get a little bit more headwind on that is we follow HP redirects, we do RPC port bind, DC RPC service discovery. So anything where one service tells us about another service, we'll follow the link over there and then do some like limitations on max redirects, things like that. And that's really helpful for us to figure out what are the ports we just don't know about that are actually commonly in the environment through redirects? So oftentimes we'll find like a weird, you know, admin HTTP server on a strange port that's really prevalent on internal networks that we would never have just guessed randomly because we only found it through a redirect off another service. So that's kind of been our approach so far to find, figuring out what that other stuff is internally. Also, I recommend, you know, like with MMAP, you say hyphen P hyphen to say, just scan all 65,536 ports, you know, back 20 years ago it was kind of, you know, you couldn't do as many a scan nearly as quickly, but now, you know, when we're on, you know, gigabit networks, um, you know, and especially if you add like those min rate options or, you know, hyphen capital T5 is insane mode, um, you could just scan them all pretty quickly. So either, you know, I have some ports that I'm looking for and I, I specify them by default or, or if I'm really doing a scan where I want to be comprehensive, I just say scan all of the ports because who knows what someone's going to have open. Yeah, right on. Um, and a lot of people don't even know what they have open. So, you know, <laughs> uh, well said. Um, yeah, trying to trying to be thoughtful of, uh, of the time here. Uh, another question that had come in. Um, uh there was there was kind of an interesting uh we've a couple of these we've answered already so i'll skip those but uh just you know free response whoever wants to it, it thinks of one first and wants to hit the buzzer and answer uh so open source legend daniel stenberg badger of uh, curl had some interesting stories from working in the public and contributors in the open source community any interesting stories from nmap or the msf development that are short and worth and worth you know safe to share in a public space <laughs> Uh, on the Metasploit side, I can say that a huge number of our contributions came from anonymous handles that ended up being, you know, very well employed people elsewhere, but they just couldn't contribute under the real name. And they did it because that was the only way to get the vendor to fix the thing, whether it's a vendor they used internally or a vendor they found during a pen test. So Metasploit has always been like a, a long term dumping ground for O'Day because it's a great way to like move the bar and get vendors to react when doing it the, the polite way doesn't work. <laughs> that's that's an awesome anecdote. Uh, very cool. How, how about you, Gordon? Any, any, any I had a any case questions? where someone, a really brilliant guy named Jay created this feature called Nmap plus V, which was before Nmap's version detection. It was kind of his own implementation of the idea. And it was a really good, it was a good implementation and a great idea. And, but I kind of, the way it was implemented, I was kind of scared that it was really hard to do security review on it. And so I ended up uh, going a different approach, you know, writing a different system for Nmap's version detection, even though, you know, I hugely appreciate, you know, creating the proof of concept, you know, was hugely helpful. And then some months later, I got an email from someone, you know, it was kind of a jerky thing, I guess, but he was like, I found this, uh, exploitable bug in mmap plus v and i've been sitting on it ever since and now that i see it's not gonna it looks like mmap plus v isn't going into mmap here it is and so <laughs> not exactly what i'd necessarily call a, a nice approach uh to do but it was like whoa i'm i'm kind of glad that you know kind of my senses were that i was scared to just like incorporate all of those because you never kind of know who's waiting to take advantage you know of any mistake you might make there was another case where i was you know hacking as usual and 
I got a call from the FBI and I was like, uh oh. Um, and it turns out they weren't trying to arrest me or anything, which was good. Instead, they, you know, actually told me that they thought, you know, our NMAP organization systems, you know, were being hacked. And you know, I have a lot of respect for the FBI, but I also kind of had some bad experiences back then. And, you know, with any government bureaucracy, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, people of various level of competence. And so kind of my arrogant thought was kind of like, Psh, you know, if we were being hacked, you know, we would know it, you know, we're the security experts here. And then I'm on the phone with them and I log into the system and it's like, oh crap, we have been hacked. And the attackers had used our virtualization provider. We were using a cloud, you know, Linode, um, and they had hacked Linode. And then from there, they were able to attach to the, um, any of the stored, any of the customers of Linode's, their nodes. And so they were able to reset, you know, an emergency password on the system. And I guess they were just like doing it for the lols to some degree. Um, but they kind of went through like the list of Lino customers and like, oh yes, this one hacking the, the MAP project will make us famous, I guess. And so they got in and they were trying to uh, dump our subversion repository and so that they could kind of make their own edits and then re-import it so it could be done without triggering. You know, normally any any commit to the repository is mailed to thousands of people, uh, not thousands of people, but um, but a lot of dozens of people. And so we would notice if, you know, if a commit, you know, was unauthorized. And so they were trying to do it this way. And thankfully they, um, their technical, they, they weren't able to, they kind of made some mistakes and they weren't able to get it, get it done, you know, in time before we, you know, booted them off and rebuilt all the systems and things. And so that's sort of another case where, you know, I guess I wouldn't call that the open source community by any means, you know, MMAP has benefited so much by the open source community, but you kind of also have to remember that there are kind of also, you know, always kind of the more malicious types who, you know, are kind of opportunistic in exploiting, you know, whether they're hacking, you know, an open source project or a nonprofit or what, you know, not everyone, you know, some are just kind of out to watch the world burn, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. There's definitely some bad actors. Uh, absolutely. Always, always good to remember that. Great stories. I really appreciate y'all sharing those. Those, those, are, those are wonderful. Um, we are we are run the course for our, our today's stream. I can't believe that it's blown by an hour already. Um, I want to call out to our audience here to say you can find the NMAP project online at nmap.org. NMAP uh, and, uh, and the book is free online. Gordon mentioned you should totally check out the book. It's awesome. Um, and to get a broader view of Gordon's projects, you should check out insecure.org. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that he's currently has his fingers in or in the past has had, had, had been involved with uh, great, great sites. And uh, if you'd like to see what HD is up to with Run Zero, just visit runzero.com. That's R-U-N-Z-E-R-O.com, uh, which does offer free trials, no credit card required. Uh, a big thanks to our speakers today. Gordon, thank you so much for sharing your time and your stories and insights today. And huge congrats on NMAP's 25th birthday coming up next week. Uh, here's to 25 more years of NMAP just a bubbly water and uh, I haven't dipped into anything stronger yet. Um, but thank you, Gordon. Appreciate your time. Great. Thank you, Pierce. And, and thanks to everyone who tuned in too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a, a shout out to HD also. Uh, thank you for sharing your time and stories and insights uh, today. Excited to see where Run Zero takes you and the teams, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Pierce. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah. Thanks, and, HD. And, and just shout out to the, just like Gordon said, thank you to the audience, uh, for, last but not least, for attending today um, and, and for your time, for being a part of the chat. Everybody be safe and well. We'll see you later.